to Ephesians. Uh, we're going to look at just a couple of verses in Ephesians 2 and Ephesians 5. And tonight is not going to be one of those keep you awake messages. So I'm going to try and make it shorter. And uh, thinking of the children here today, uh, I'm going to do my best to, to get us. Uh, I want to help you tonight with some just some thoughts about the state of man, the state of man. Uh, why are people like they are? Why do we face what we face? Now, for some weeks, uh, I've been talking about on Sunday nights about the suffering saint. Why? What is it that motivates this evil world to be so evil? You think, why, why would people burn people? What would make people be so totally vile that they would burn people alive? What is it that would cause people to run from God? Literally to say, I don't want anything to do with God. Here's a God that so loved the world, he asks nothing. Trust him and he'll save you. Do I have to go to church? No. Do I have to get baptized? No. Do I have to become a, a Mormon, a Presbyterian, an Episcopalian, a Baptist? No. Trust me and I'll save you. How hard is that? And yet people hate it. Hate it with a passion. What is it that moves a billion or more Muslims to, uh, to literally be willing to blow themselves to pieces to destroy people who believe differently. What, what is that? And it's the state of man that causes us to be and do what we are and what people in general do. And there's both sides of this tonight, the, the Bible reading Christian as well as others. And so uh, I want you to follow along with me tonight. Be, I'm going to give you three or four words that have to do with the state of man. And uh, maybe that'll be worth scribbling down, but hopefully there'll be some things that'll help you. Let's stand for a moment as we read the scripture, starting in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 and at verse 11. Ephesians 2 verse 11. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles, and again a Gentile is a non-Jewish person as a general rule in the scriptures gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands that at the time you were without christ being aliens from the commonwealth of israel and strangers from the covenants of promise having no hope and without god in the world but now so the opposite but now in christ jesus ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Father, bless these moments and uh, help the time to be a help as we view people, as we uh, strive to keep a heart of love towards sometimes a vile and corrupt world. And uh, may we have a, a little bit more of an understanding, but also more of a, a tenderness uh, toward the blind and the deceived and, and the corrupt. And so help us and direct us, we pray. Uh, guard our hearts that our hearts might be right. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Now, we're going to look at several verses, so keep your Bible open. I'm going to give you several words. And, and uh, in the Gospel of John, Jesus talks about people who walk in darkness and they stumble. They don't see what they're stumbling at because they're walking in darkness. And Jesus then says, but ye are not in darkness. You're in the light. And so in the Gospel of John, he begins describing two groups of people, one in the dark and one in the light. And, and that's obvious. We all understand what that is. And, and uh, the, the idea of running around in the dark is crazy. It's trip and you step on things and you stub your toe and all that stuff. And, uh, but it's, it's a part of life. Now, the first word I want to look at tonight is this word ignorance. Just plain old ignorance in verse 12 of chapter 2. That at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Now, here is the unsaved person. Look at the words describing him. First one, or phrase, without Christ. Second phrase, alien, or word, the, the second word, alien. And then the next word, strangers. The covenant of promise. All of the promises in this 
that are covenanted to you through the blood of Christ and, and through his sacrifice on Calvary. They're strangers. They don't have any idea what that is. And then having no hope. That's a terrible thing. And then lastly, without God. This is a description of a type of people. Without God, no hope. Strangers, they're unfamiliar. They are not a part of the covenant. They're aliens and they're without Christ. And that's just a, that is a, a, a world of ignorance. How could they be, how could they be so blind to the love of God? How could they be so blind to mercy? How could they be so blind to, to uh, forgiveness and grace and all the things that are dear to us? The promises, the promises in the scripture. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And lean not to thine own understanding. In all the ways acknowledge him and he'll direct thy path. Simple promises and, and they're just blind. Literally a, a world around us. I mean out of 7 billion people, the vast majority are ignorant completely of the promises of the covenants of the relationship and of, of hope absolutely without hope of all the people that I've talked to in the world from different religions uh, I've never met anyone who had the word hope not anybody uh, I remember talking to a, a Mormon something he was a big shot in California I don't know if they're bishops or whoever they are but he's a over a bunch of California Mormon churches. He lives in Marietta. I knocked on his door, and, and I liked that I knocked on his door, and he didn't knock on mine. But um, uh, we talked a little bit. He said, oh, we believe the same thing. And now look, how did Jesus treat the Pharisees? He was pretty hard on them, all right? He was very nice to the poor and the, you know, the, the prostitutes or whoever, but he was hard on them. And I said, you're lying. I didn't say you're a liar. I said, you're lying. You don't believe that. He said, oh, it's the blood of Christ that saves us. I said, you mean I can get saved without the Mormon church? He said, oh, yeah. I can get saved without baptism. I can get saved without anything to do with the Book of Mormon or the Mormon people. Oh, yeah, we're brothers. I thought, you're a devil is what you are. He was a liar from the beginning, and his children are liars. Stinking liar. I didn't stay very long because he was. if he took me all night, he'd keep me from knocking on doors from people that were honest. But other than that man who was lying about having hope, religious people don't have hope. They're hopeless, and it's such a sad thing. You see, in the garden, once sin entered their heart, Eve was deceived. It was Adam who brought sin into the world. And once Adam um, ate the forbidden fruit, and he, he opened his heart up to sin, and once he did that, he was now naked, and it was a physical exposure. They were made aware of how vulnerable they were, how without protection they were. They were made aware of how helpless they were in this world, and what a horrible, tragic uh, decision that they made. And then God moved them out of the garden. They were castaways. They were defenseless, and that is the state of every human being without Christ. Adam and Eve, as they're banished, and even before they're banished, that, they're, that's a picture. Why, why would Adam and Eve be hiding? There's a God of love, a God of mercy, a God that they knew personally, and suddenly, every day, Adam walked with God, and Adam walked with God. But, but sin, that fallen nature, the death of the remember I talk about there's a natural man and a spiritual man. And when when Adam ate the forbidden fruit, the spiritual man died. And the natural man became defiled. And that natural man does not want the things of God. That natural man wants nothing to do with God. And what you read in Genesis 3 is a picture of world history. Men hide from God. They lie to God. They make excuses. Right? What's going on in the Garden of Eden? When God says, where are you? He said, well, we're hiding. Well, why are you hiding? Well, because we're naked. So, what do you mean you're naked? Somebody, you know, you eat the forbidden fruit. Well, this woman, they start blaming. Don't be blaming your wife. You, you ate the fruit. 
And, and here, this is a picture of the hopeless, the, the, the world without. See, before they sinned, they were in a perfect place, perfect protection, security. And by the way, one day we're going to be back in a place of perfection. That Christless state is a state of ignorance and a state of vulnerability. He can't see his enemy. The unsaved man out in the world, he has no idea there is an enemy. He can't see his enemy. And the, the fiery darts that you and I, we use the shield of faith to quench all the fiery darts, the wicked one. The unsaved have no shield. They have no way to quench those fiery darts. And, and the, the world out there is taken captive at his, at his will. Remember the prophet who uh, back in, in, I think it's in Kings, um, the, the army comes, they're in Samaria, the northern half of the kingdom, and the, the army comes and the prophet comes and says, oh, you're in the wrong place, follow me. Remember that? And the whole army, one unarmed preacher who could see, led a whole army that was blind, brought them into town where they were surrounded by another army and said, okay, now you can see. That's how vulnerable that unsaved world is out there. That unsaved world, they are hopelessly ignorant. They can't see. They can't understand. They can't perceive. As we look here, if you want to look over a page or two in Ephesians, I'll come back to where we were in Ephesians 2 in a minute. But look over to Ephesians chapter 6. Because we're going to talk about three types of people tonight. First, the unsaved. And then we're going to talk about the saved without armor. And then the third, the, the child of God with the armor. But look there at verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you the what armor of God? Whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore. Now, he goes through a list of what the whole armor is. But the point in verse 13 is, if you and I do not take unto us the whole armor of God, we will not be able to withstand. Understand this, the enemy that we have in this world could take you out in an instant. Other than God's mercy, we have no hope. The, the arrogance that, uh, you know, the, the scripture, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And what's that got to do with anything? It's a statement of how great God is. Can I tell you something? You have no defense against the devil except the whole armor of God. The only promise you have to be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, against the attack of the devil, is the whole armor of God. And without the whole armor of God, you're vulnerable. And you're vulnerable against an enemy that you cannot see. You're vulnerable against a world of darkness. And more than we can possibly imagine, that enemy has taken captive at his will. We'll see in a minute. Um, taken captive at his will, countless unsaved, and in often cases, believers as well. The Christless state, the unsaved person, is ignorant, blind, naked, and vulnerable. He can't see his enemy. He can't ward off the attacks. And the incomplete, the armor, the incomplete armor on the saint leaves Satan an advantage. Remember the Bible says we're not ignorant of his devices. It talks about lest Satan should get an advantage about, uh, in Hebrews about bitterness. Um, we should be careful about bitterness lest Satan get an advantage. You know, it, it's like in wrestling. Uh, you, you do something and the, the referee resets it and he lets the one guy get an advantage hold in a wrestling match. And if we're not in our armor, if we're not fully protected, Satan gets that hold. He gets an advantage over us. Uh, it's, it's not scriptural for us to run around acting like Satan doesn't have any chance at us. The fact is, we have, an, we have an adversary, the devil is a roaring lion, who walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Don't be foolish, child of God, understand, 1 Peter 5.8 says, he's walking, looking. 
And he's always been. Remember in the book of Job, chapter 1, Satan comes up before God. Where have you been? I've been going to and fro on the earth. What's he doing? He's looking for somebody he can take out. And that, that wily devil, that subtle from the Garden of Eden, the serpent was more subtle than any creature which the Lord God had made. That subtle, vicious, attacking lion just going around the perimeter, looking and looking and looking to find a way to take the child of God down. That first Peter is not written to unsaved people. That's written to you and me. So we need to remember that the incomplete armor gives Satan an advantage. Uh, if you want to just listen, I'll be right back here in Ephesians 5. But John 12, 36, while ye have light, believe in the light, that ye may be children of the light. These things spake Jesus and departed. See, Jesus as he came, that's John 12, 36. Jesus came to the people. He was the light of the world. And he came to the people saying, while you have it, you better put your faith here. You better believe in that light and become a child of light or else. It's a dangerous thing to be in a world of darkness. You look over at Ephesians 5. We're going to be back and forth between these verses. But look at Ephesians 5.8. Ephesians 5.8. And the grammar here, I didn't catch the, the, the real strict wording until this week. But look at Ephesians 5.8. For you were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. You see, the unarmed child of God or the unarmed child of light might be able to walk through this world and be less vulnerable. I've got the breastplate of righteousness. I've got the helmet of salvation. I've got the sword of the spirit, but I don't have my loins girt about with truth. I've allowed dishonesty and corruption and lying. I've not gotten my feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I am partially armored, so I'm partially protected. But I've got an enemy out there, just like the unsaved man has an enemy. And if I don't put on the whole armor of God, I will not be able to withstand the work of the evil one. And the child of, of, uh, of light is different because I want you to look back at this, at this passage there in Ephesians 5.8. Look at the wording in Ephesians 5.8. For ye were sometimes... There's no participle. That means the word in. Is that the right word? He didn't say in Ephesians 5, 8, ye were sometimes in darkness. Ye were sometimes darkness. That unsaved person isn't in darkness. They are darkness. I never, I never, how many times, I've memorized that passage. I don't know how many times I've read that and I thought, that's bad. <laughs> that's real bad. And then look at the rest of it. But now are ye in? No, there's no in. Now are ye what? Light in the Lord. You understand before you got saved, you weren't in the dark, you were dark. And when you get saved, you are not in the light. You are light. Remember Jesus said you are the light of the world? It's not that we chose to turn the light switch on and it's the same person was walking in darkness, but I flipped the light switch on, now I'm walking in light. That's not the case. There is a transformation that takes place when you get born again. You were darkness and now you are light. You are a new creature in Christ. Something supernatural, something spectacular took place. And not just are we in the light, we are light in the Lord. A child of light may walk in darkness but still see. A child in the dark, a child of darkness can never see. Because they are. They bring, remember the guy in in the cartoons, it always had the cloud over him. Who's that guy on Snoopy? Anyway, Pigpen. Everywhere he goes. That's what the unsaved are. They bring their darkness with them. Wherever they go, it's dark. 
and, and they're, they're in the schools. They're dark. They come home. They're dark. They go to the store. They're, they bring darkness. Young people, that's why you've got to be careful who your friends are. Because it's not, that person's okay. No, if they're not saved, they are dark. They bring the literal darkness of a condemned world with them. fact is the darkness cannot be enlightened because you can't turn darkness to light now God can because they can get saved as you, you take your you know you have an eye cut out of you or you know injured you lose an eye I have a friend who was cutting with a pocket knife kids you always cut away you don't cut toward and this guy was cutting something like this and it cut through fast and he, he cut out his own eye and he's a preacher in North Carolina. We were in college together, and he's fine. He could even shoot a basketball. I thought he had no depth perception with one eye, but he was a good shot. So anyway, that was a 40 years ago too. But, you know, you can't replace that eye. Now the creator can. And God can do it. Look, look hold your finger there in Ephesians, and look at, look at Luke 4. Luke chapter 4, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Luke chapter 4. This idea of darkness, of not being able to see, this world that we're in, and this is a familiar passage, probably many of you know it by heart, or certainly you're familiar with it, but, but when Christ talked about his, his coming and why he came, why is it there are some places you can go you feel oppressed? Have you ever been in places that you literally feel oppressed? And there are places that you just think, this is creepy, why is it? Because you are a child of light. You are light, and you're walking into that dark world. And it, it's creepy. The, and, and there's different degrees of how creepy. There are places I've been where I thought, I am totally out of my league here. Yet I'm in the light. I'm safe. I know God's, God's everything's okay. But I'll tell you what, there's some places that are so dark. San Francisco is one of them. New Orleans is one of them. And there's a lot of primitive places around the world that are that way. And you talk to missionaries, and they go to these places, and it takes us. That's why an Adoniram Judson spent years before he had his first convert. Because the place was so possessed with darkness that that, that candle of light that the child of God brought in there had to fight and fight and fight to, to suppress the darkness and to bring in some light so that, that people could see. You go to a place that's, that's difficult like that. Well, look at Ephesians, or look at um, Luke chapter 4, and look down at verse 18. Luke 4, verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath uh, he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives. And now look at this. Recovering of sight to the blind. God says you're in darkness and you cannot see. Not only are you in darkness, you are darkness. But if you'll come to Christ, he'll recover your sight. And you'll be able to see. You know, when I, when I see a person that's handicapped, blind or deaf or whatever, uh, all of us have a, a heart of some compassion and and uh, there's a tenderness toward them. But you know what's funny? We don't have any tenderness toward the people who are spiritually dark. Not that we don't have any, but you know what I mean? There's some people, I, I've never really felt a lot of compassion toward the Hitlers and the, you know, the people who are murdering millions of their own people. And uh, it's tragic. Those people are dark. They're, they're evil and they're, they're a dark people. People that go blowing up others, strap explosive themselves and get in a crowd of, of young people or adults and just for the sake of, of blowing them up, Jesus said, I'd love to help you see. See, you and I look at it and we're over here. We are light and we look at that and we think, what is wrong with you? Well, we don't feel that way toward a deaf person or a, a blind person. They can't see. And our job if they'll listen, is to bring them to the light, that they might be light in the Lord. But I'll tell you what, that's, it's not the easiest job. You know why a lot of Christians don't go soul winning and a lot of people who used to go soul winning stop? Because this is hard. 
It's dark. It's sometimes evil. You know, there's there's t- why is it when you get ready to witness in there, there's somebody over there you think, I'm gonna go give them a and you you don't have enough strength to pull the track out of your pocket. Look, it's easy here. You know why? Because I'm in the light. I'm I'm light in the light. I'm among the light. I'll tell you what, you start going into the dark, and the forces of darkness are oppressive. And you're you're trying to find your way into a dark world. It's a lot more convenient to go to a church that doesn't talk about witnessing and soul winning and getting the gospel out. Much more convenient. Hey, let's just come to church and gather the people of God. Boy, it feels so good in church. Yeah, it feels good because you're in the light with people who are light and you're light. And we're very comfortable here, light with light. But there's a world in darkness. There's a world that is dark. A darkness so dark. A darkness so oppressive. A darkness so overpowering that a darkness that you read in in the book of Exodus during the plagues, because each of those plagues, there's a lot you can apply with them. They said that it was so dark they could feel the darkness. That's a demonic dark. Poor lost souls. If you look over, you can keep there in uh, Ephesians. We'll be back. But look at 2 Timothy if you want to. Again, it's a familiar verse. 2 Timothy 2.26, if you just want to write it down. It reminds us that Satan has this incredible power over the lost world. 2 Timothy 2. And how guarded we should be. Why we should be careful about the world's junk that comes into our home. And why we should seek to be so covered with the armor of God that, that we can quench the fiery darts of the wicked one you know we have this idea you know i'm saved my kids are saved my wife or husband's saved we go to church everything's all right and you know we hold up the the sword of the spirit and the shield of faith so we don't drink and we don't smoke and we don't cuss and we don't you know, only when people need to get cussed we cuss but you know we we ward off the illegal drugs and all that and we kind of feel like that's the spiritual battle that isn't the beginning of it. Bitterness, wrath, deceit. See, the, you look over there in Galatians. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Those are the things that you and I can do because we've got flesh. But the darkness, the darkness that's over there is so corrupt and so powerful and so oppressive These people, ye were darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. And that, that, look, this thing about having the whole armor of God, there is a world of darkness out there that is powerful beyond words, and only the mercy of God keeps us from that mess. Look there at 2 Timothy 2.26. It says, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. At his will. That lost world out there, they don't have a chance. That's why we should go soul winning. That's why we should go to the jails and the rest home. That's why we should run bus routes. That world out there, you you look at young people. I was talking to someone this week who works with uh, delinquents, we would call them, but with kids that are in trouble. Eight-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 12-year-olds on their way to prison from murder to every kind of corrupt thing imaginable and evil beyond words. And we're here. We are light in the Lord. And some of you that grew up in Christian homes, you think, well, I I wanted to punch my brother once. You, You don't even know how dark that world is. Every decent person wants to punch their brother. It's a big brother, that is. It's a baby brother. You just hug them because they're awesome. (laughs) But that's a. How does how does a child or a teenager out in the world 
do all the corrupt and the vile and the filthy? How do they how do they go to that that extent of evil? Well, they're dark. Not they are in the dark. They are dark. Their inside's dark. Their outside is dark. They they have no light of love. They have no light of Christ. They have no light of mercy. They have no light to see. And you're over here, and, on, and, and, and we're flesh. We have bad days. We say some things, do some things. We, we get out of line. But understand this. When you have the armor of God, you're protected. You can withstand the darkness. And then areas you get vulnerable. You, you let down your, your guard because we're flesh. And something said, something you, you know, you get in a place and your attitude or whatever. And, but you know what? Our wrong wrong is it's like dropping you know in the daylight you're not paying attention you're looking at your phone and you stumble over a crack in the cement or something but these people are in the dark like running through the jungle and there's spiders and lions and tigers and bears oh my and all that stuff and and they're like blind they have no idea what's going on darkness that that a darkness that can be felt sinful blind shameful no form of decency whatsoever a darkness that is born of evil, or evil that is born in the darkness. These last weeks we've talked about suffering saints. What would possess someone to take a teenage girl and tie her and throw her into a river to drown simply because she got baptized? What kind of evil is that? What kind of evil, like in the bulletin tonight, Felix Manns, he was a, a, an educated, leading reformer in the 1500s, and, and, he, and he was saved. But he realized baby baptism was not in the Bible, which it's not. And he, he began, he got baptized by immersion, began preaching baptism by immersion. Look, they chased him from place to place, arrested him. He got away, arrested him, tied him up like a pig with his hands and his feet, put a pole through his hands and feet, carried him through town, and he's preaching, hanging upside down. They put him in a boat, row out to the middle of the river, and his mom is on the shore saying, keep the faith, son. You know why she could do that? Because she was light, and he was light, and they could see just fine. And they toss him over the side of the boat, and he drowns. What kind of evil people? And by the way, these are, these are the reformers. These are Protestant reformers. These, these are the the. Calvin, Luther, Zwingli, that crowd of people, <clears throat> what evil possesses them? But that same evil is what gets a Gates Foundation to decide which cultures can be killed in Africa that don't fit us anymore. Don't think, don't think those same murderous people are not alive today. They just have more money and more expensive suits. You see, those people that Gates thinks are unimportant in an overpopulated world that they want to kill because the evil leaders are in the dark and the people they want to destroy are in the dark while the children of light, the children who are light, we're going into that darkness. Others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the spot, garment spotted by the flesh. You ask any of our missionaries, ask Brett and Jen, they were in Africa. And you ask our missionaries that go this Wednesday night, um, Stephen Benefield will be here from Cambodia. You ask these people if they don't walk in, in this darkness every day. That's why so many missionaries, their ministry is shorter than a ministry in America because as bad as America is, this is awesome. <laughs> we live in a great place. And young people, if you're getting this poor me, this is a horrible life thing, I hope you'd have enough sense to read a little bit and realize where you'd be in the rest of the world. Uh, this is a dark world. How can you have a world today in, in, in this 2021 where a woman is not allowed to read, not allowed to go to school, not allowed to drive a car, not allowed to go out of her house without her husband or a male family member? And if she was caught with her veil off, they'd cut her head off. How do you get that? That's dark. That's a dark world. I was at a Walmart in, where was I? In Lexington. And there's this guy walking along, doesn't look any different than you or me. I'm, I'm assuming he was Middle Eastern. 
but he had a gal with him and her sleeves were down to her wrists her veil was completely over her face two little eyes couldn't see a bit and, and all the way to the floor and she walked hanging on to his arm and and I thought what an oppressive world of darkness that gal she is dark her husband's dark their world is there's no light there that's a tragic thing in this world where you and I are those who would seek gain by the defamation of good and decent people they're over here in the dark and the darkness comprehends not the light Jesus said you, you wonder why sometimes people in the dark attack the light because they don't understand it it, it exposes them they see their own shallowness they see their own pettiness they see their own corruption and the, those in the dark they hate the light and not only do they want to drown them and burn them and bury them alive, but in our culture, any way possible that those in the dark can destroy those in the light because they don't understand the light. They can't sense the light. They're, they're totally incapable of, of understanding what it is like. Those in the dark will point out the, the evils of the light. They can't fathom it. And you read these stories that we've talked about on Sunday nights a little bit, but there's hundreds of them just humble godly christians like in the 1600s and 1700s in in the the new england area why did they have to go out to some island in the wilderness to have church there were just a handful of them what did this 20 or 30 christians have to scare a nation of anglicans again we're talking about 20 people on noodles island They'd canoe out across the water to the island to have church. They'd sing a few hymns and someone would read some scripture. And why were the constables searching through the dark to find him and destroy him? And when they got in the boat to come over, they'd get past, they'd have guards and they'd say they're coming and everybody'd take off in their own direction and no one would be out there, a couple of fishermen maybe. What, what possessed this group of people to hunt them down? They're dark. They are dark. Why would someone spend four years trying to destroy a president? The economy was better. Every tangible thing in America got better while President Trump was in office. Everything. Why do you hate that? Well, it's easy. They're dark. They're dark. They hated his freedom talk. They hated his talk about the church. They hated his talk about the Bible. They hated that he had Billy Graham in the rotunda for days. A preacher. What's the big deal? He's just an old guy who died. He was light. And darkness hates the light. You can't, you can't be in this, this country right now. If you, if you think you want to be president, God bless you. You're not very bright. See, a man who's blind is in total darkness. But understand this, a Christian who's unarmed, they don't have their armor, they're very vulnerable. And we can drift this direction. There's an awful lot of vulnerability in the child of God who doesn't keep their armor on. Ignorance, blindness, look back to verse 12. Ephesians 2, I'm sorry. Look back to Ephesians 2 and verse 12. I'm really trying to finish early, but it may not happen. But I'll finish before bedtime. One of our gals teaches English to Chinese people. I said, when do you start work? She said, 2.30 in the morning. See, 2.30 to 6 or whatever, she teaches English. She tries to stay awake. Ephesians 2.12, look down there at verse 12 that at that time you're without Christ, without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants. It's so strange. Um, I've been, just for the sake of some of our newer Chinese members, I've been listening to some Chinese and picking up some phrases, and I'll, I'll send them notes in English, and they want to learn English, and so I'll send them a note in English, but I'll put a Chinese translation there. You ever look at Chinese closely? 
Spanish is not bad. It's, it's our letters, and they just mess up the way they spell things. They put an O or an A on the end of the word, you know, milkshake O. Uh, Chinese, that is a mess. It's a mess. It's alien. It's alien. I look at those, and I'll show it to them. I'll say, does this say this? And they usually, it's Google Translate, and usually, they'll usually snicker and say, yeah, sort of. And why is it so strange? Because I'm an alien from that. I'm completely different. It doesn't fit. And without armor, the Christian needs to understand that we are ignorant and blind and we're alienated. And the less of that armor of God and the less close you are to God, the less you are armed, the less protected you are. Remember, uh, John, uh, the Apostle John, uh, he, he said in 1 John, he said, that which we have seen and heard and handled, the word of life. J John said, we touched him. We heard him. We felt him. We knew him. And you get over here and you know him. Oh, man, there's something that world can't understand. He's mine, and he loves me, and, and, and I can hear his word, and I read it, and it means something to me. And they're over here thinking, you're a freak. Those in darkness, they, they don't get it. They don't get it at all. Now picture this. You're a child of God, and you marry an unsaved person. You're, a, you're light in the Lord, and you marry somebody who's darkness. What are you going to have for a relationship? And there's no way. Remember at Kadesh Barnea, the 12 spies, they go and spy out the land. For 40 days, they come back and they say, man, let's take the land. This is great. And the 10 were bad, two were good. Remember the spies? The 10 spies said, no, we can't do it. It's terrible. It's terrible. They saw no way to defeat the enemy because they were dark. And the multitudes joined them. And said, let's go back to the leeks and garlic of Egypt. And Joshua and Caleb said, oh, no, that'll be easy. We can do that. What, what was the difference? Light. Somebody could see. Somebody had faith. Somebody, somebody just believed God and said, you know, we can do this. And the multitude said, no, we can't. The multitude said, you can't do it. The state of an unregenerate mind in, a, in James 4, 4 says friendship with the world is enmity with God. Now think about this. How can a, a person in darkness, James 4, 4, friendship with the world is enmity with God. They're a friend of the world. They are taken captive at his will. How do they resist the devil? I mean, he's already inside and he's wanting to get more. There's, they have no resistance. You and me, we are light. We have Christ. We are possessors of the spirit of God. We've got his word to fill our mind and we've got his spirit to fill our heart and soul and we can resist darkness keep it out like the three little pigs you know get out of our house but they're dark already they have no way of resisting the devil what a tragedy they're blind they're aliens they're unarmed taken captive by him at his will look over at matthew 12 and, and i'll wrap this up maybe in a couple more verses if you find Luke along the way, we'll look at Luke 19 and Matthew 12. We'll go to Matthew 12 first. This spiritual world that you and I are in, and again, understand, you're, you're looking for Matthew chapter 12. Understand, you that are in light, you've, you've got a Christian home. You guard what gets into your house, and you guard the influences you have. And your, your worst day is, oh, there's a you know, little chink in my armor and maybe an attitude here, there. My, my kids are making decisions for God, and they're struggling with decisions. And so you've got, you've got flesh, but you're, you're children of light, and you're in a home that's children of light, and there's going to be some differences. But I'll tell you what, as soon as we start opening the door to the flesh and we let the darkness in, we're still light. I'll tell you, that darkness is an awfully deadly thing. Look at Matthew 12, 44. Matthew 12, 
Uh, maybe I better go to the verse before it. Ma I better find it now. Matthew 12, verse 43. talks about the, the devil that possesses a person. Uh, Matthew 12, 43. Uh, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, and he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none, then he, then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out, and when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself and they enter in and dwell there and the last state of the man is worse than the first even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation man this world over here of evil <clears throat> the devil can come and go bring more with him how'd that guy get a thousand demons in him the legion a thousand well you know what there, this, this is an unarmed person, and, and I, I, wish we could, I wish I could grasp how lost this world is. I wish we could all grasp how dark this world is. Not to say stay away, but to bring some light to it. To bring some hope. Look over to Luke 19. Well, where are we in this world you say, well, most people don't want to hear. No, they don't. I'll admit that. But I'll tell you what, I am glad somebody talked to me. I'm glad the teenage guy, Luke chapter 19, I'm glad the guy who witnessed to me witnessed to me. And, you know, think about it. If someone witnessed to 100 people and you were the 101st, and a hundred people weren't interested, so he quit witnessing, and you were the hundred and first that was going to listen. What do you do with that? We, we can't not give the gospel out. And you may give it boldly and confidently, and I may give it with an anemic, you know, fearfulness or whatever, but it's just the gospel's powerful. I'm not the power of the gospel. He's the power of the gospel. It's not my confidence that wins people to Christ. You ask around the room how many people have gotten saved by someone who fumbled through the words and didn't know what they were doing. God saves people, not you. The word of God is quick and powerful, not me. That old dark world. Are you in Luke, where are you, in Luke 19? Look at verse 14, but his citizens hated him. Luke 19, his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. You can read the whole story but the master sent out the invitation, uh, sent out the, well, let's just read it so I can get my, my story right here. <laughs> Luke 19, um, verse 12. And he said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called to his ten servants, delivered them ten pounds, said unto them, occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, we will not have the, this man to reign over us. That's this world. God gave us food and clothing and light and dark and rain and oceans and mountains, and God gave us all this, and the majority of the world you're in says, you're not going to reign over us. They're dark. They're dark. And you're over here thinking, man, I feel like I'm the minority. You are. Thank God for it. So I feel like most people aren't believers. They're not. Aren't we blessed? Isn't it a gift beyond words? that something happened in your heart and you trusted Christ as Savior and you went from a child of darkness to a child of light. Man, I, you can't lose that. You can't lose the understanding and the depth that I am a child of God. Go back over to Luke 14 just because you're right here. There's so many good verses like this, but, but we're, man, we are blessed to be where we are. Look at Luke chapter 14 and verse 16. A man made a certain man made a supper, Luke 14, 16, and bade many, in verse 17, he sent his servants at supper time to say to them that were bidden, come, all things are now ready. And they, they all, look at verse 18, they all with one consent began to make excuse. But isn't that what happens when you're soul winning? A witness to somebody at work or a neighbor. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground, I must needs go see it. That's a lie. Who buys ground without seeing it? Verse 19, see these are polite liars. Verse 19, I bought five yoke of oxen and I go to prove them. I pray thee, I have me excused. Another said, I've married a wife. Now there's a reason. Yeah. 
God was mad. You know, then you go down to verse 20, 21, 22. God, the master says, go find the poor and the broken. Find the homeless and bring them. That's why we have a bus ministry. That's why we ought to go find homeless people. And it's awkward for them. But I'll tell you what, this world, darkness does not want light. They just don't. There's three types of people in the story. Number one, the child of darkness. Number two, the child of light. And then three, a very vulnerable child of light who does not have on the armor. And they're very vulnerable to be misled, to be hurt or to be led to wrong deeds or wrong thinking. Don't think, Christian, that you and I can't go wrong. Every day, you and I need to decide to walk as children of light. Every day, we need to, we need to prepare ourselves to face the darkness it's a dirty and corrupt world. Jesus said in John 5, ye search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life and they are they which testify of me and ye will not come to me that you might have life. Over and over and over, Jesus said they won't come, they won't come. You, you, you think you feel bad that you go out and people aren't listening. Jesus was doing it and he knew he was about to die for him. And I understand Calvinism, limited atonement. God only died for the elect because they're a bunch of jerks. I mean, it's not true. He died for all men. So we need to talk to all men and beg God for help because somebody, Jude says, we're going to pull out of the fire. It's our job. It's our job to be saved. It's our job to be armed, to take, put on the whole armor of God. And it's our job that this ugly world, it's ugly. It is ugly. It's dirty. It's vile. It's corrupt. Think how many people, though, Doctors and nurses go across the world to dirty places and diseased places, and they don't do it for an eternal reason. They do it to give the guy another year with his leg or to fix a dental problem. Or, and they're, they're in the, a, a dirty old world out there for carnal things. You and I are doing it for an eternal thing. The whole world is lost in the darkness of sin. The light of the world is Jesus. That's our job. Walk in the light preach the light. All right, Father, help us tonight. May we create a, a passion in our heart for the light. We're, we're different people. We're, we're not aliens. We're family. We're not strangers. We belong. We're not a, away from you, but we're near you. And what a great privilege. But I pray you'd help us to realize that we need the armor to stay true, to stand. But there's a world out there that needs us. A world out there lost and dark. And they can't see, they cannot get out on their own. And they need us. I pray you'd bless us and help us. It's a dirty world that attacks and hates the light. There are people there that will get saved. And we're the example of it. So help us to be a help, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together just for a moment.